Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes for the week ending April 15th, 2021. Uh, this is Videocast Episode 77, Podcast 67. And as always, we're going to kick off with our media spots and get to the highlights of the week. We're doing it a day early again this week because tomorrow morning at 11, I'm going to be on Kitco for the first time, which is uh, the largest metals website but i'll be talking global macro michelle mccari who used to have me on i24 news when she ran that station and anchored is now running all of content for kitco so excited to be on with them and then uh tomorrow night at sometime between eight and nine i'll be on cgtn global uh probably with rochelle Kufo. so i won't be able to do it on friday and do this the spots and do all that so here we are uh first i'd like to thank liz clayman and ellie terrett for having me on fox business on tuesday and that was when they announced that uh the j and j vaccine caused blood clots in six it's now seven people out of about six point eight million vaccinations administered uh so it's you know it's a one in a million story but out of an abundance of caution uh the cdc and the fda uh, paused it for the time being and my sense is they'll have that back on track in no time um you know there are going to be the key is they'll they'll be finding what are the contraindications what are the commonalities among the people that uh uh, that had uh, this uh, blood clot issue and thrombosis and, and low platelets, and then uh, they'll be able to get it in gear. But on that day, J&J &J was down a few percent. It had been down a few weeks into it. And what I shared with Liz was that with the market up 85% off the March 2020 lows, uh it's it's getting harder and harder to find value and big pharma it, there's still tremendous value in this pocket of the market now that the 10-year yield is stabilized uh people are looking for strong dividend yield and it also has the added benefit not only the dividend yield exceeding the 10-year uh, in most cases by at least two times, but also it's a defensive group. So if we do get some chop and some headwinds after such a big move, uh, this is where money goes to hide uh, as well as staples and utilities. So you get two bites at the apple, low valuation, great dividend yield, stabilizing yields, and uh, tremendous franchises that are going to be uh, uh greatly benefited by the normalization of healthcare as people go back to their healthcare providers they stop worrying about covid they start worrying about diabetes and overweight and cancer and all all those other things uh high blood pressure rather uh that they have to worry about on a regular basis which is going to really tremendously help these franchises so first off on j and j uh my my uh, kind of suggestion was to buy on the weakness uh, immediately, but these things usually take a few days to bottom. So a third, a third, and a third is usually ideal. And that's worked out just fine. It's shown some strength in the last uh, 24 hours. And J&J uh, &J was trading at 15, just over 15 times 2022 earnings uh, estimates. It, it, it trades at a historic average multiple of over the last decade plus of about 18 times. So uh, certainly trading below its historic mean, number one. Number two, it has a 2.5% dividend yield. And three, it's raised the dividend every single year for nearly 60 years. So when you have an opportunity to buy a franchise like this on sale due to a bad headline, you take it because uh, those opportunities don't come out around that often. And 50% um, of their sales are going to uh, benefit from the pharmaceutical momentum we discussed. They've got Remicade for arthritis. They have Stellara for uh, psor psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, plus, uh, plus their cancer drugs. Uh, that's 50% of sales. They, they're also well diversified with medical devices at about a third of sales. And then the consumer division, which is 20% of the sales, think baby oil and band-aids. Uh, that's just a stable uh, ongoing franchise. So that was our, our thought on uh, on J&J. Uh, uh, &J. Then Pfizer, while it's uh, up over 10% since we suggested it last month, it's still trading at 12 times 2022 earnings. Its historical multiple is 14 times. So trading at a discount to that, obviously a big discount to the market, which is you know 21, 22 times forward. 
uh, has a 4.2% dividend yield, so you're paid while you wait, which is two and a half times the 10-year yield. And, um, you know, it has the advantage of uh, being a first mover uh, on the vaccine approval. They expect to do 2 billion vaccines in 2021 with $15 billion of sales. They came out today officially saying that they expect a, a need for everyone to take a third booster before the end of the year. So that'll be uh, in addition to those two, 2 billion vaccines. And then they've got a blockbuster with Eliquis, uh, the blood thinners up 17% sales year on year. And uh, lastly, uh, Novartis is uh, uh, going to be a huge beneficiary of the second half healthcare normalization as people go back to doctors and get scripts. Uh, the, they, they're having gains in the oncology portfolio. Entresto is their heart failure drug. Cosentix is their psoriatic arthritis drugs. They trade at 12.7 times 2022 EPS uh, versus their historic average of 22 times so 12.7 times versus 22 times historic average over the past decade their dividend yield is 3.66 percent or twice the 10-year dividend yield these are no-brainers in my view and we saw today as a matter of fact um elliott management the 40 billion dollar fund uh uh put a huge investment in GlaxoSmithKline. We'll get to that in a little bit, but you're gonna see more and more money pouncing in because where can you put a huge amount of money and go to sleep at night in a market where you know many stocks are trading at really elevated multiples and, and earnings really are gonna to have to play catch up quick to justify some of these multiples. So uh, we've just told you where, and uh, thanks again to Ellie and to Liz for having me on. Moving along on the same day I was on OAN with uh, Stephanie Hamill. I want to thank Stephanie and Cameron Kinsey for having me on the show. And in this uh, show, we covered quite a lot of things. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, the stimulus and the impact on um the impact on uh, inflation and inflation expectations moving forward and the budget deficit. Uh, this is a long, longer conversation. Uh, we'll go through some of the points here. Um, but we covered, uh, first off, the stimulus and inflation. And the key point that I was trying to make was that we've spent $5.3 trillion on uh, fiscal stimulus so far. It looks like we may have another two trillion coming with the Green New Deal slash infrastructure plan. Then you add the four trillion dollars of uh, balance sheet expansion, and you're getting over fifty percent of GDP of stimulus uh, and liquidity, and that is to counteract what was a three point five percent contraction of GDP last year, or seven hundred fifty billion. So. You know, all in, give or take, uh, eleven trillion dollars to solve a seven hundred fifty billion dollar problem. It's no wonder you have bidding wars all over the country. Uh, if you don't come in five percent above ask on on a house, you're you're not getting it. I found uh, that to be the case with hotels as well, which I thought there would be some distress because occupancy was down so so dramatically. But there's so much liquidity in the market that um, uh, there there you know there's just too much money chasing. Uh, too few goods. And we saw it in the inflation numbers, which were impacted by a uh, 9.1% 9, 9 increase in gas prices. Uh, restrictions on drilling federal land are not going to help that uh, in the near term with demand going through the roof and jet fuel demand going to be through the roof um, um, at, at the back half of this year. I was down in Florida for a swim meet and uh, over the weekend with my girls, we wound up, uh, by the way, we got two first place ribbons for the six and eight year old and then a handful of second and third place as well. Um, so it was a really great trip. And then uh, fortuitously, you know, we come out of the airport, we see all these signs for WrestleMania 37. <laughs> Never been to a wrestling match. So, we, you know, I looked at my wife. I said, why not? And uh, we just had a tremendous time there. They put on a good show. It, it really helped me understand, you know, the franchise that they've built over decades. Uh, certainly was something to check off the bucket list. And, and we enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, so moving right along, um, you know, with that level of stimulus, we, we see that... Uh, 
earnings estimates uh, at 20 six percent growth this year but 176 dollars a share on the s p and gdp estimates of six percent we think those are too conservative at this time with that amount of money in the system and that's why we've been pretty consistent since uh the first week of january on this podcast we've been looking for about you know uh mid-teens s p appreciation for 2021 uh we also uh, thought that this would be like a 2013 or 2017 like scenario where you just have this consistent grind higher with multiple five percent the three to three uh, percent to five percent pullbacks but nothing more and it's continued grind and I, th- I think that's still going to hold to be the case with with this amount of money in the system and um and and that's that's basically what we're seeing. We think that earnings are going to come in closer to two hundred dollars this year, and uh, GDP probably closer to eight or nine percent. Uh, and the market will figure that out in in the back half. My sense is we'll get some weakness when the tax talk really dials up quickly. There was uh, articles out this week that a bunch of CEOs said it was going to dramatically hurt R and D and hiring, etc. So maybe they'll come to 25% instead of 28%. But they are going to go up because uh, the de- the Democrats swept swept and they have a blank check and that's that's part of the plan. And uh, and that was uh, telegraphed well before the election. So that's what the Americans voted for. And that's exactly what they're going to get. Um, so so that that was uh, the primary thing. Uh, we also since it was Tuesday, we said the real story, Stephanie, is going to be bank earnings. Bank earnings are going to be tremendous this quarter. Uh, first, the yield curve was the steepest uh, is the steepest it's been in five years. So their net interest margin uh, certainly went up. Uh, the loan demand isn't quite there yet, but if you listen to Moynihan and you listen to Charlie Scharf, uh, they are very optimistic that it's going to just pick up tremendously, on, particularly on the CNI commercial and industrial side. So that was good to see. Uh, the other point we made was that they were over reserved. They, they, uh, the industry as a whole reserved about 110 billion dollars on the assumption of 20 percent unemployment. We're at six percent, uh, so they they were releasing billions of reserves in the earnings calls this week. And then dividend and buyback guidance is what we told uh, Stephanie to look forward to. We saw Charlie Scharf talking about the dividend being too low, so that'll be going up. They have their stress tests in June. And uh, we saw Bank of America talk about a $25 billion buyback authorization. So expect a lot more of that. Uh, expect a lot more of uh, rationalizing the operational footprint. You saw some costs in uh, Bank of America that the market didn't immediately like. And that's related to uh, same thing with Wells. Uh, you know, shutting down branches, rationalizing the operational footprint, realizing that a good portion of their workforce can work from home so they don't need uh, full retail space. And number two, they can deliver many of their products digitally as their as some of the competitors are doing and still have the exposure to do massive CNI loans, which they have a moat to do and um, and some of the other businesses that that require space. So these are all going to lead to better efficiency ratios, more cash flow, more buybacks, more dividends. Uh, so uh, you saw Wells Fargo had their biggest jump after earnings. I think in history, it was like a 6% move in the stock, 5 6% move. Uh, and I think it tr- still traded up today, even though banks were down. It was up uh, 42, for, 42, it was up to $42 and change. Huge move off the low 20s uh, less than a year ago. So that's exciting. We continue to hodl as our Bitcoin brethren would say, although I don't know if they, you know, I'm, I'm not in that club, but I understand what hodl means. Uh, so we're diamond handing Wells Fargo, as they say, but we can sleep at night because we understand the intrinsic value. Uh, and, and that's that. So and then lastly, uh, Stephanie asked me about NFTs. Uh, I was in the same court as Stephanie in that, um, you know, I like to buy businesses where I can understand the intrinsic value. I can sleep at night. The NFT story, though, I'm sure there will be a place for them in in the future and in history. But usually the initial mania, you have to get the bubble that has to pop, wash out. And then when everyone's down on them, look and see what residual value is there. And uh, that's when you could look to pick it up. I, I won't be in that because they don't yield anything. It's just, you know, it's, it's basically like, you know, uh, collecting it. 
art, I guess, in some ways, and you're just hoping that someday someone will pay you more than you paid. That That's really not my game. Uh, but some people can make a lot of money doing that. Uh, my suggestion is wait for the first big washout. It would be the equivalent of um, Amazon, you know, was a huge runner in the late 90s. It collapsed 90% even as the business organically grew. The, the multiple assigned to it was completely re-rated after the tech wreck. That was the time to buy, not when everyone said they're going to change the world. It was after they crashed and no one wanted them. And they say, well, they just sell books. That's when you wanted to buy. It'll be the same thing with NFTs, probably some some of these crypto things, and um, uh, as well as the SPACs. You're going to have to see which ones wash out. Right now, if you're in the SPACs, you want to be betting on the jockey, people with proven track records, not just hustles of uh, you know things that uh, are hard to understand and, and will get washed out uh, when the tide goes out. So uh, thank you to Stephanie Hamill and Cameron Kinsey. Uh, for having me on. And then on Monday, uh, I want to thank Meta Singh and Shivani Kumarasan for having me in their article. Um, and this was about inflation expectations. There was some level of fear that the numbers would be enormous, which they, they were higher than expectations, but lower than a worst case scenario. Going into it, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said that they're not eager to change uh, rates kind of set the stage that re regardless of where the number comes in, we're going to stay accommodative to reach full employment. And that was the key thing. He was kind of setting the stage on 60 Minutes this weekend that um, no matter how hot this number comes in, we're not leaving until we get full employment. And uh, so the market didn't have to fear raising rates sooner than what they promised 2023 or 2024, which, you know, won't be the reality of the matter because they'll have to raise rates sooner. But at least he said, he's basically said full employment is more important than inflation running a little too hot in the short term. He believes that inflation is transient. Bullard came out, we won't, and said we won't know till the end of the year. Uh, I, I agree with Bullard, and uh, I think Bullard's just been spot on on pretty much everything over the years. But um, uh, so, so that's the story there. Uh, the Fed is going to stay in the game, and the market likes that. So um, this was out from the IEA. Oil demand is recovering despite vaccination hiccups, the IEA says. Uh, that that was predictable. Wait till you see the back half as jet fuel demand picks up. Uh, that's going to be an exciting story. And this was the article I referenced. The majority of CEOs say the Biden tax hikes would harm business, slow wage growth, uh, et cetera. So maybe that's how they keep inflation in check, raise taxes, slow growth, and uh, and slow the wage inflation, which is wages are sticky, uh, which is uh, a key factor. And uh, that's what we've been watching on a weekly basis. So far, so good. They're not uh, going up dr dramatically, but that will be the first tell. Um, this is an article from Bar Barron's J&J vaccine pause could boost Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, this this just came out today. That's what we said on Tuesday on Liz's show. Um and uh, this is an article by Jacob Sonenshine. Oil stocks have gotten crushed. I think that's a little bit hy hy hyperbolic. They've done their normal, you know, 10% pullback consolidation. Uh, and then he says they're, they could be poised for a comeback. Um, and uh, do, 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 do. so they quote Tom Lee, which we talked about last week. Extremely uh, energy is oversold. It's under owned. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, demand in the second half. So that that's just more confirmatory stuff. You note all these articles. By the way, here here's the next article: Buy bank stocks after City, Goldman, Gold, uh, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and J.P. Morgan earnings wowed. Said this research group as well as Wells Fargo. Um, similarly up upbeat results. Biggest post earnings gain in a decade. And th this is from BCA Research. And the number of factors that they're laying out uh, boost in a large drawdown in reserves. We were talking about that in July. Uh, moving forward, banks will need to focus on their ability to expand loan portfolios. That's correct. We saw that in, in the earnings calls in the last couple of days. Banks' core profits come from borrowing from savers at low rates in the short term and lending at higher rates in the long term. The dynamics of fiscal stimulus in the U.S. have caused deposits to surge and loans to shrink, but this is expected to change once the economy reopens. And he put a couple charts here. You can see um, 
banks to the S&P 500. And then you can just see how closely it tracks the 10 year uh, treasury yield. So as uh, we're, we're trading in this range in the short term, or maybe a counter trend move where yields compress for a few weeks or months, um, you know, banks may consolidate the gains and then and then move higher towards the back half as the 10 year moves towards two. We'll talk a little bit about that uh in the article this week as well and then it shows how the 10-year tre treasury yield uh always uh precedes or presages rather uh a move in net interest margin at commercial banks as we can see the 10-year yields up and the net interest mar margin should start should start to follow that in coming quarters which will be a, a greater boon to earnings than even the loan loss reserve re reversals that that we've seen so um pretty compelling argument but these are the arguments we were making for those who have been with us since last year we were making in the summer when no one wanted to touch them with the 10-foot pole now that they're all up 100 plus percent uh now everyone's getting excited and there's still a tremendous amount of room to run as we said last week the time to to sell banks is what is the next time the yield curve inver inverts because that's the top of the market you usually get another six to 18 months on average after the yield curve inversion before you get your crash and that's many 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 years away so we're still in the steepening part of the uh of this of the process it doesn't preclude 10 and 20 percent pullbacks on the way up but you know a bank like wells fargo with the business expansion we're going to see and the demand moving forward uh it's it's got a lot more room to run doesn't mean you don't peel some off on the way up after you're up 100 150 percent maybe even 200 plus percent but um uh i think it's got many more years and uh you know many more percent to go uh and this was just kind of the beginning uh and uh, we're excited to be a part of it and that that doesn't even speak to when they get the um asset cap Re removed which uh is is hopefully trending toward the back half of the year on top of it but even with the asset cap they traded up well over 50 dollars, so that's that'll just be whipped cream and a catalyst moving forward um now this is the article that we put out on march 4th 2021 you can uh, see it or you can go to hedgefundtips.com and just uh either click on under categories commentary or se sentiment or you can just type it into the search bar here and what we said on that day was uh, we were talking about how tech had corrected and what we talked about what has not worked which was how tech was down what could work next on Fox Business last week we talked about the rate of change for the rate rise potentially moderating in ensuing weeks it appears there is an attempt to make a stand here so um, so this was key and this was quite a bit prescient um, because here's what's happened since uh, it has held that range and even today uh, traded below the range uh, so it's it's gone sideways uh, basically since that if you actually move if you take the range back to here it traded to the bottom of the range down to 151 today and then it closed up at 157 so this this sideways range after going from 100 to you know 160 in a matter of five weeks 160 basis points on the 10-year treasury yield uh it's basically gone sideways for the last four or five weeks and um what we said back then would happen as a result of that if these levels can hold or reverse for a bit we could see a significant reversal in defensive higher yielding stocks like consumer staples big pharma and utilities as their yields would become attractive once again either natural market fo forces will cause a pause in the rate rise or we'll begin to see fed speakers start to trial balloon a repeat of operation twist uh fed selling of short dated bonds to buy more long end this is this temporarily flattens the yield curve and brings down and stabilizes long end yields without increasing money supply uh fed launched operation twist on september 21st 2011 here's what happened to the two 10-year uh, ratio next this is when operation twist begins now this is interesting we've steepened just like we did after the uh, 2009 crash and we got to the top of this chart top of this chart and then operation twist began so um we'll see if that's required later in the year if yields uh, blow out but in the short term it looks like they're going in the other direction and they're stabilizing uh 
for some time. Um, so the purple vertical line is the beginning of Operation Twist. While that was the peak of the yield curve steepening last cycle, it was just the beginning of the rally in financials. Okay, so even if the yield curve stops steepening or the ratio of the two two year yield to the 10 year yield rather um, levels out, um, banks still still were at the beginning of their cycle. And it was the same thing here as this ratio even went down until it inverts banks rally until it inverts again banks rally. We are nowhere near a new inversion. So. Um, so this is what happened the last time you had that type of rise and then they stabilized uh, in, from took off from their September 2011 lows. And here's what happened to Staples, what happened to uh, Big Pharma and what happened to utilities. So this is what we were anticipating. And this is exactly what's happened since we put out this article on um March 4th, 2021, and the the one before the week before that is when we first started talking about utility staples and uh, big pharma. Now, what are we looking at here? So we're looking at utilities, and you can see from that March 4th, literally almost to the day, they've just absolutely taken off. CMS up from 53 to 63, uh, WEC up from 80 to 95, uh, XEL, LNT, and our two favorites, Dominion, up from 68 to 78. And, you know, this is four or five weeks. Uh, and AEP up from 74 to 87. I mean, these are huge moves for utilities. So when you look at it on a daily basis, you go, oh, well, that was a great call and I missed it. When you step back and you see these things are just getting started. They're one of the last pockets of value left after the markets rallied 85%. Uh, and, and these things have a lot more juice, I think, in coming months, especially as long as these yields stay in this range or now it's dropped below the range. That's going to boost these. I mean, look at Dominion. Huge move, but just just getting started to what it can do. Um, all of these. Uh, where's AEP? Same exact thing. This was the pre-pandemic peak at 105. It's trading at 87, 81, up from you know 74, 75. So there's a lot of opportunity still in this group, and um, and and we like that. Now uh, the second set was uh, staples, so you can see what's happened um, in the ones. So if you remember, we were talking soup and cereal. So here's Campbell had this huge move up. Uh, now it's consolidating. We think this is gonna gonna resume its uptrend. Same thing with uh, Kellogg had a huge move, and then it consolidated the last couple of weeks. And we think as these uh, yields are are, um, are behaving, we think it's going to take another like higher general mills, same exact thing. And again, let's take a step back and take a look at the weekly. You can see these these are the ones, you know, they're just get, getting started that uh, have lagged. Same with Campbell Soup here, uh, have tremendous opportunity, tremendous upside moving forward, tremendous value at these levels. We've talked about the dividend yields. We've talked about they're trading at low multiples and we've seen in recent weeks they're passing through their higher costs to the customer so their margins are going to remain robust and they're going to be a beneficiary moving forward uh, more staples Clorox just getting started um, uh, Colgate had a huge move it's breaking out today um, uh, Procter and Gamble same thing huge move since that article from 122 it looks like to 137 just broke out again today uh, Kimberly Clark tissues and diapers here you go so uh, so we like this but again if you step back it's like wow I missed it nope just getting started just getting started uh, still tremendous value here Kimberly Clark just getting started so um, so we like those groups and then of course Big Pharma which has been the laggard they've just started to finally move um, you know, uh, Novartis is, is one of our biggest. That's only up from 83 to 87. We think that's got a lot more room to run. Uh, J&J, this was the day I was on, uh, with Liz. That was the bottom it put in. Now it's, now it's rallying off that. Uh, but these companies like Merck, Gilead, and look at Pfizer, huge move, but it's, but it's, you know, again, from 33, just about 33 to 37. So, um, 12, 13, 14% in, in a handful of weeks, which are big moves. But if you step back, um, 
look, this is where there's still value. That's why this is GlaxoSmithKline. That's where you saw Elliott Management take a multi-billion dollar position. Here's the article, by the way. Hedge fund builds multi-billion pound stake in GlaxoSmithKline. Activist groups investment comes as UK drug makers. Performance lags behind rivals. So not only is Glaxo lagging, but Pfizer has lagged. Um, uh, Novartis has lagged. And activists are going to come in as they see the playbook from uh elliot because these ceos don't want to lose their job because they're they pay extremely well uh so they're going to be taking action spinning out businesses unlocking value increasing buybacks increasing dividends etc and these groups that have really lagged post pandemic um like the gileads of the world by the way that's still cheap but certainly novartis looks like a big move just getting started merck same thing um and biogen is lagged Glaxo looks like it's just now taking off. And where is uh, Pfizer? Here we go. It looks like a big move. It's just getting started. I mean, it's it's not even trading up and, and they're going to basically own the vaccine business around the world. Um, OK, so that was a recap of those. Let's move on to the article of the week because we got a lot of good stuff to cover here. Um, <laughs> the name of the article is the Justin Bieber Peaches stock market and sentiment results. I really had a tough time coming up with a song to describe the stock market sentiment this week, but after Coinbase IPO'd at a hundred billion dollar valuation, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh, the market participants must be singing from the same hymnal as featured in Justin Bieber's latest hit Peaches, where he says, I got my peaches out in Georgia. I got my weed from California. And I think at some of these valuations with a business like Coinbase, which albeit it's the industry leader and it's the first mover, but at the end of the day, it's a trading platform. Competition is going to come in. Margins are going to come down. You know, you can tell me all the reasons why Coinbase at $100 billion is as valuable as Raytheon or General Electric or Goldman Sachs at about $100 billion a piece uh, or more or worth more than CBOE and the ICE exchanges combined. But to that, I'd simply reply, turn on the song and uh, and assume you must be smoking what Bieber gets in California. Uh, and this tweet by Karen Feinerman uh, summed it up best. She's off and on um, CNBC uh, Fast Money. Um, and she, you know, the cartoon shows, it says, quote, this is better than magic beans, Jack. It's stock in the company that makes the magic beans. <laughs> so, you know, uh, Coinbase trades crypto. Crypto are the magic beans. And uh, and competitors are going to be coming for their margins. That's if uh, central bankers and regulatory bodies don't outright uh, uh, come after it. Because effectively, they're ceding all their power if they give up their currency. Uh, and uh, it's unlike a government to sit back and just let that happen. As we're seeing in India, they're not allowing it, albeit it's decentralized. People can do it anyway, but, you know, it's um, it, it's going to be a push-pull. I mean, it, it seems like it's, it's here to stay in some shape or form for sure, but um, some of these valuations are, are, are a little bananas, and they can get more bananas in short term, but if you look a few years out, they'll get re-rated, and then you look for the residual value after the first big washout is, is the way to play it. Or you can play the mania now. I mean, some people are very good at that. That's, that's just not my knitting. Um, okay. So we covered Liz's show, which was great. We covered Stephanie's show. We can move down bonds and currency. This is very interesting. Um, on uh, Ruth Carson from Bloomberg reached out to me regarding the U S treasuries and the U S dollar regarding my outlook. And here are my latest thoughts and how we're thinking about it. Uh, we've covered this a, a number of times, which led us to some of our conclusions that helped with the staples, utilities, and pharma trade. Uh, but one of the key factors I look at is what the commercials are doing on a weekly basis in the Commitments of Traders report put out by the CFTC each week. And uh, they're, they're usually early and they're usually right. So... Um, uh, they were buyers of the U.S. dollar into the bottom in January. So we can just look back here and then the dollar started to rally. Um, we've gotten a bounce, but I, I think there's some more strength left in this move in coming months as commercials have not really started selling aggressively ahead of a top. So like um, you would usually... 
um, start to see them start to get short into the strength and they're not, they're just not doing that yet so they're still net buyers here i think this still has a, a you know considerable short term strength the us dollar uh which is counterintuitive given given all the money that we're printing and uh the headwinds you have on that front but it's it's again it's all on a relative basis and because our recovery is going so much better than the rest of the world who have bungled their vaccine rollouts uh, it makes sense that money is going to flow into the dollar in the short term. So that's why I think that we're going to see a little bit more strength. And that's that's really what the commercials are showing. And it's not like a crystal ball. It's just what's happened pretty much every single time. It usually leads to a bit more strength in the short term, despite all of the fears about inflation and money printing. It's it's again, it's all relative. So um, uh, it, it's certainly understandable that money will flow where, where there's uh, the greatest recovery strength. As for the 10-year uh, treasury, the key story is that the rate of change has slowed. Yields stopped rising at an accelerated pace and are now in a short-term sideways range between, you know, about 151 basis points if you go down to here and 176 basis points. Uh, so that's a good thing. The disorderly part of the move is behind us. This was disorderly how quickly it, it, uh, the rate of change was from 100 bips to 175 bips in six weeks. Um, and while we could get a short-term bounce in bonds, compression and yields, and we we saw that today, um, and and we could see it for you know several weeks, uh, possibly, it's likely that yields, uh, by the end of the end of the year, a bit higher than where they are now. Um, and and the reason I say that commercials have not been buying bonds in a quantity that would lead me to believe a strong bottom is in at this time. Uh, so while a short term bounce is certainly possible, bonds are likely to finish the year modestly lower than they are today with yields higher. So, you know, these are the points where you you get a bottoming in bonds where you just see this aggressive push by commercials aggressive push by commercials and then you get a, either a complete rally or at least a short-term rally you know where where they've been massively buying ahead into weakness they're starting to buy into this weakness but not massively um you know and you just look big buying into weakness big buying into weakness big buying into weakness and then you get these rallies uh rallies rallies so we're getting that but we're not quite there and that that's why you know maybe you consolidate sideways a little bit uh you could get a counter trend bounce which is what it looks like we're going to be doing in the short term which would mean a compression in yields but i think the trend through the end of the year um I don't I'm, I don't think yields are going to blow out. I don't think there's going to be any like tantrum or, or anything like that or bond vigilantes. But I do think that we're going to in an orderly fashion, potentially after this counter trend move that may last a few weeks and change everyone's mind and fake them out. But I think we probably wind up the end of the year somewhere around, you know, 2 percent on the 10 year yield. But, you know, to get from a you know, we were at 175 just a week ago, you know, 25 basis points in nine months is not a lot or 30 basis points wherever we are. Um, you know, so so it'll be very orderly. The, the market will be able to digest it. It'll be healthy. Um, uh, but but the but the shock is is behind us. And, uh, you know, it could be something like this where you got the shock out of the way and then you just have this sideways grind and chop through the end of the year, but no real progress one way or the other. Uh, just a lot of noise, and and that would be um, healthy and normal, and um, what we'd like to see. We don't want to see rates at three percent overnight. That would just throw things off the rail. But a, a steady, healthy move, supported by growth, uh, I think is going to be a very, very positive thing. Um, so the point I made to Ruth is we're not taking any aggressive currency or bond bets at the moment. Um, Early last month, we, we just went over this, we added utilities, staples, and big pharma as an intermediate term play on the stabilization of rates. It's working exactly as planned. I think it, it continues to follow through over the next you know month or two. We, we've got more upside. And uh, you know we just listed the names, which we've uh, listed many times, Pfizer and Novartis on the drugs, AEP and uh, American um, Electric Power and Dominion on the utilities, staples, uh, uh, Kellogg and 
Campbell Soup and a number of others. So this is the best way to play the intermediate term stabilization of yields in our view uh, as they sold off in January and February on the abrupt rate rise. They also have the added benefit of being defensive sectors in case we come up against any short-term chop and volatility in the general indices. These are the sectors that um, where money goes to hide if you get short-term chop. Um, okay, moving on to the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey this week. This is all about sentiment and positioning. They interview 200 managers overseeing over a half a trillion dollars, I think $600 billion of assets. The highlights are, uh, obviously, there's euphoria, um, uh, huge optimism, um, you know, and we'll, we'll look at some of the fears. But obviously, sentiment's coming around. Everyone was very, very skeptical all the way up. 85% move off the bottom. Now, the consensus is everything is great. And that's when you have to start to be a bit more careful. The other thing that's happened is uh, banks are the most overweight sector for the first time since May of 2018. I mean, it's just hysterical. Um, and uh, ironically... You know, when we were talking banks, they were down here where utilities and staples are in the doghouse. So now we're talking utilities and staples. We do think banks have more to, more to run over the years, but they'll probably breathe in the short term. Uh, but utilities and staples is is uh, in the doghouse, and that's where we want to where we want to play because probably six months out they'll be up here, and everyone will be overweight uh, just as we're we're you know laying it off. So. Um, Okay. The other thing is banks are more of a secular trade for us uh, longer term. Same with energy, uh, which, by the way, managers are still dramatically underweight. Um, whereas utility staples and big pharma are more of a shorter term intermediate trade trade that we that was that was basically a rates play that that's working nicely. Um, okay. Only 7% of investors think we're in a bubble right now. So again, you know, although what's interesting is so. On the one hand, that's worrisome that people aren't afraid of anything. On the other hand, um, over almost 70% think this is a late stage bull market. So they're discounting the correction from last year and the negative GDP and the recession and, and saying that, no, no, that wasn't really a recession. It's still late stage because of what they're seeing in terms of SPACs and uh, IPOs and the mania and all that stuff. And that's understandable, but I think it's wrong. And I think that this is an early stage bull market. I think we're a year in. I think we'll get our normal pullbacks. We got them in 2010 and 2011, early stage bull markets. I think we do get more abrupt type of corrections to scare people out early next year. Uh, you know, the 10 or 20 percent variety like you had in 2010 and 2011. But for now, I think we're in that kind of grind higher disbelief, everyone chasing up that missed it. Um, uh, Three percent pullbacks to just, you know, get people's the hair on the back of their neck to stand up. But uh, I think that's the environment we're in in this year. And we finish up a bit higher, you know, seven to nine percent uh, more than than we are by the end of the year. Mid teens is what we were looking for since the beginning of the year. Um, okay, so more investors now expect sh higher short term rates, so they're betting against Powell being able to hold out. Um, record investors expect a stronger economy. You did have that at the beginning of cycle in two thousand two and also in two thousand nine, so that's actually a good sign, not a contrarian sign. Um, investors inspecting, expecting higher inflation. That that's where you had the scare again. Remember that uh, that I said April of two thousand and eleven when the Fed had to start to talk about twist uh, because yields were blowing out because of inflation expectations. Uh, you also had it early in the cycle in two thousand two to two thousand four. So this is a normal thing. Why? Because government gets stimulative. People get worried about all the money printing. Uh, so that's, that's also okay. That's, that's natural for this part of the cycle. 90% of respondents expect a stronger economy. 85% expect global profits to improve. 93% expect higher inflation. 57% are expecting higher short rates. Uh, I think that might be premature before the end of the year. Um, 50% say the ex economy is experiencing a V-shaped recovery versus only 10% believing that in May when we were pounding the table. 
Uh, 7% think we're in a bubble and 25% think it's an early stage bull market. That number is going to move up to 50% in the next six months, maybe 70%. And 66% believe it's a late stage bull market, which is good. That tells me there's a lot of caution and fear and hedging in the market, which means it can push higher. Uh, and we can get that 7 to 9% extra before the end of the year. A lot more under the surface, pay less attention to the indices and more attention to the rotation and opportunities under the surface, which has been, which is our knitting and which what we, we talked about since episode one on this podcast video cast. Uh, this is interesting. 74% of investors think Bitcoin is a bubble. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't have anything to say about this one. I got to be honest with you. They asked me to go on CGTN uh, last night. Uh, I guess it was Wednesday to talk about Coinbase and Bitcoin. And, you know, I just, I, I just had to pass on that. I'm, I'm not a Bitcoin per person. That's not my cup of tea. I think it's great for the people who've gotten seriously wealthy on it. And, um, you know, I, I might <laughs> I might diversify some of that wealth, but, you know, hodl away. I mean, what do I know about that? I, I, I have no way to think about how to value it or what it's worth. I understand sc scarcity effect and selling it to the next guy or girl, but uh, that that's that's a that's a completely different game. Um, OK, so. Uh, da -da -da -da. This is interesting about overweight banks. Uh, uh, you would take it as a contrarian indicator except for the fact that the last two times that you were at these levels was 2013 and 17, uh, which are the two environments that we're looking at, which, by the way, um, we covered last week. Uh, I actually want to bring that up. Um, okay, so I just go to sentiment like I always suggest to everyone else, and then... It will list all of the articles. Here's last week's article. So um, it's interesting that they got overweight banks. And it's this is the environment I think we're in. 2013, 2017, where you had these, you know, following these huge dislocative crashes in 2016 and 2011, and then as you broke out, you just persisted for, you know, in the case of 2013 to 15, it was 24 months. In the case of 2017, it was 12 months uh, with a big interruption. And then it continued higher for another six months. But, um, you know, we're just getting out of this mess. So, you know, while you had these 3% pullbacks all the way up, 3 three to 5% pullbacks all the way up, it was generally a grind higher and it just wouldn't let people in. And I, 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 think that's it now obviously you see this breakout it would be natural to get a three percent here and scare, scare some people that should benefit utility staples and pharma because that's where money will go to hide um so be on the lookout but as you can see you know it's really just after this type of consolidation and dislocation it, it's really just getting going and those are the last two times where you saw the overweight to banks at the beginning of those coming out of these dislocations so it's also another constructive uh, period. So you can see it right here, 2017, same type of thing. Everyone got overweight banks and the market just ground higher. Same thing, 2013 to 15, overweight banks, and it just kept going for months and months. So more exposure is going to be given to these cyclicals, banks, energy, etc. Uh, cash levels moved up a little bit. Uh, overweight ne equities near all-time highs. That always happens at the beginning, same thousand, 2013, 2017. So it's not bearish because it's the start after they were just puking. They finally get overweight and then they just have to keep chasing, keep have to, have to keep chasing. You can see it. So this is a very positive thing. Uh, last month, uh, investors chased tech and healthcare and utilities. These were the, the ones that we talked about. Utilities, healthcare, and some small pockets of tech. Well, they went overweight tech. Um, they also got bank and they got out of emerging market. And Staples is interesting because um, staples went up and they also got underweight commodities and energy, which means it, it probably caught their breath and can start to take a next leg higher. We'll see what earnings look like next week, but that should be a good thing. Uh, the other thing we saw is uh, now everyone thinks value is going to beat growth. We, people were laughing at us last year. 
And uh, that happens at the beginning of new cycles. This was after the 2009 crash. This again in that 2013-14 period and 2016 period after the crash. So it's probably, a, again, another pretty, pretty good sign moving forward. And because people are so excited about it, my sense is that things like utilities and um, uh, the less clearly identified with value. So value, you think energy, you think banks right away. Uh, so maybe some of these others will stand up in the short term just as everyone else got into the other stuff and then they'll be able to make their, their next leg higher, multi-year leg higher. Um, okay, 62% of surveys respondents said they are net overweight equities, which is close to all-time highs. So again, a 3% pullback would be nice to just shake them and rattle the cage for the Johnny come lately's. Um, Hedge fund manager, uh, fund manager optimism on commodities has peaked and fallen to a net 23%. That's probably good for energy stocks in the coming months where they've caught a breath and now they can take another leg higher um, as people got shaken, late money got shaken out of them. And uh, most crowded trades are now long tech, long Bitcoin, long ESG, uh, long global cyclicals and short treasuries. Well, the, the short treasury got reversed a bit in the last uh, week or so. And we'll see what happens with tech and Bitcoin uh, and ESG. This chart from FactSet is interesting um, with uh, tech being the most crowded trade. It shows percentage of companies in the Russell 3000 with negative net income 1980 to 2020. We're at the highest level. We haven't been at levels like this since, you know, the tech wreck. So for those, you know, buying companies with a, without uh, abandon that are, big on promises and small on profits, be careful. Uh, I think you're going to be much better rewarded for buying those stocks where there's still value, where there's intrinsic value that can be easily understood because when it gets rocky, that's where money's going to go. And that, that's and in the meantime, you're paid to wait. So uh, biggest tail risk this month were the taper tantrum. So people worried about bonds, which is why bonds reversed this week and started going higher. Uh, fears about inflation. Again, same story. Uh, those fears reversed. Higher taxes. That debt drum is just starting to beat. COVID vaccine rollout. People don't seem worried about that anymore. So, you know, maybe we get a couple variants to scare people in the short term. And then uh, peak economic growth. Uh, some people are saying that. I think that's... Uh, it remains to be seen. Um, so the contrarians, according to Michael Hart, and that with a bullish market outlook, we're buying into emerging markets, which have cooled, staples and utilities. So we like we like that, the exact areas where the majority of respondents were found to be reducing exposure. And that's generally our knitting. We, we go where the puck is going, not where it's been. And we, we like that story. Uh, AAII sentiment was obviously very high again. Uh, retail investors are still exuberant. Um, fear and greed index was neutral at 50 and the national association of active investment managers. Let me just see if this changed it as anticipated last week, it was at 50. I said, this is going to have to jump. It jumped to 90. We covered that in the podcast last week. And what's it done this week? It's uh, now up to 96 and change. So they're chasing away. And my guess is they'll get to a hundred or so, and then they'll take the rug out. Uh, what does that mean? You know, three, you know, modest, correction which will be more meaningful for those sectors that are overdone could be you know while the general indices could pull back three percent you could see um, crowded trades get smashed uh, and see some of those stocks down you know five ten fifteen twenty percent like we saw with tech in january and february many of the names were down 30 20 30 40 percent so um so that's that we built our message for the week. Uh, we, we all know we built up uh, selected positions in utility staples and pharma since we first mentioned at the end of February. We think the rebound in this group should continue in coming months, even if we have a few fits and starts after a very big jump in the past six weeks. We continue to hold our banks, energy and defense and aerospace stocks from much lower levels last year and would not be surprised if they continue to take a breather before resuming their uptrend and new highs later this year. With the market up 95% of 85% uh, of the lows, we're very selective where we put new money to work. We'll look to add to our big pharma positions, but only if any weakness presents itself. In the meantime, be careful of buying IPOs and SPACs that are big on promises and small on profits. 
If you make the mistake of chasing the flavor of the month without any discipline and analysis, you'll soon find people asking you if you're like Justin Bieber and get your weed from California. <laughs> so be careful of that. Some unusual activity, uh, options activity in Petrobras this week. Someone bought 10,000 contracts of the January 2023 call options at $20 strike. Thought that was interesting. Estimates continue to go up on earnings. They're at 176 for 2021, 202 for 2022. I think they're too low. I think we're going to find our finishing out the year 190, 195, which means the multiple is not as high as it seems. Earnings this week were off the charts. Uh, for the most part, JP Morgan, 450 versus 306 expectations, bottom line. Uh, top line was 10% better than estimated, 33 billion versus 30. Wells Fargo, almost double estimates. Uh, estimates were 69 cents. They came in at a buck five. Uh, revenues also beat 18.06 versus 17 and a half. Uh, and Goldman, again, almost doubled 18.6, uh, $18.60 versus $10.10 on the bottom line. 17 billion versus 12 billion basic estimates on the top line off the charts. Uh, Bank of America, same story, beat on the top line, bottom line. Uh, Citigroup, same story. They're shutting down like 13 different markets. They're rationalizing their footprint. They're just going to be a lean, mean, profit-making machine. So we love the bank groups. I think uh, BlackRock increased their AUM by like 39% this this year. So, um, so earnings have just been generally strong. And then um, economic data. Um, today we saw um retail sales blew expectations out of the water 9.8 percent uh month on month versus 5.9 percent estimates which was big obviously the stimulus checks had something to do with that uh philadelphia fed manufacturing index blew away expectations was at 50.2 versus 42 percent new new york state empires new york Empire State Manufacturing Index blew away expectations 26.3 versus 19.5. Initial jobless claims blew away expectations were only 576,000 versus 700,000 estimated. And core retail sales off the charts 8.4% month on month versus 5% expectations. Uh, the one number I'd keep my eye on that no one talked about though is continuing jobless, jobless claims were worse than the last print and worse than estimation estimates albeit by a small amount 3.73 million versus 3.7 million keep an eye on that that is uh interesting uh so that that's uh you know put a bookmark there and keep an eye on that uh crude inventories big draw this week that was a good thing we saw the eia report uh we see the flying more than a million people traveling 1.5 million people traveling i told you we couldn't get reservations at a decent restaurant in tampa all week for you know any time after 4 p.m obviously we figured out how to do it but it wasn't easy and the places were packed business is booming there's traffic on the highways exciting to see uh what else do we have here uh cpi uh inflation came in a little hot but uh powell prepared the market on uh, 60 minutes on Sunday night, two points, uh, both 10 uh, ten basis points higher than anticipated, 2.6 versus 2.5% on the CPI. On the core CPI, again, 10 bips, uh, 30 bips versus 20 bips. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Uh, and core CPI year on year, 160 bips versus 150 bips expectations. As I said, gas prices were up on the uh, full CPI, 9.5%. So that had something to do with it. That's not going to change. You restrict drilling. It's been no major investment because banks withdrew uh, funding effectively due to ESG mandates. But more than that, because <laughs> the oil companies were irresponsible and they were drilling everywhere they could. Uh, it created oversupply. And, uh, and that's now changing. So it's been rationalized. No major investment for five years. Federal restrictions, it's going to benefit the big players. Demand's going to go through the roof the second half, and uh, you're going to see a multi year run for, for the big players and for commodities. So, uh, all very positive stuff. Thank you so much for listening in this week. We're going to be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one.